Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. Now, this past week I've been rifling through my record collection and pulling out all the old LPs I have featuring a man who can claim to be one of the most successful German musicians of the last five decades or so. And if I tell you he's also an excellent designer and artist, the person indeed behind the cover of the Beatles' legendary album Revolver, you'll probably begin to realise that I'm talking about the accomplished bassist Klaus Vormann. Here he is. Klaus, I'm so excited. Great that you're here today. Thank you. You look great. Yeah? Thank you very much. <laughs> You've got your 70th birthday behind you. Your 71st indeed. You've got this new record out, A Sideman's Journey. That's an interesting project. And everybody's talking about you at the moment as a living legend. How does that feel? Well... I know it has been a great life up to now, and um, it's not my the end now, but uh, it was fantastic. I, I was lucky and uh, good at the same time, which mm. is a good combination. And this project, The Sideman's Journey, is that, is that something that you view very much as a chronicle of your, of your musical life so far? Well, I tell you what, the idea really came from my wife. Mm -hmm. I was 70 and she thought, well, now is the time. You go and see your friends. Why don't you do something? Plus, she said, uh, let's do it for a good cause so we can raise some money for the Lakota Indians in America. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what we did. Mm -hmm. and so it was obvious that I would do something to, with those tracks I played bass on, which is uh, all those songs like uh, My Sweet Lord or If Possible Imagine or, you know, Harry Nielsen's Without You. Those were, the list was long and I had to pick some of the songs. Tough choice. Uh, you've mentioned some of the people you've recorded with, some of the people who are on this album you've played with. You know, you, you, you've mentioned the Beatles, for example, people you've been involved with. There are others, Lou Reed, Randy Newman, Harry Nilsson, you've mentioned already, Carly Simon, B.B. King. I could go on for a long time to come. Uh, from this sort of this cast of many, who is the one person who's left the biggest impression on you? The biggest impression, George Harrison left the big, biggest impression. He was a great friend of mine and he meant a lot to me, very much so. You see, the thing is, people always say I'm a session musician, which is, in a way is true, but I, was, I can count the people on my hands which I worked with because they always asked me again and I never was one who went to the studio in the morning playing for a washing powder and then go in the pits playing in the orchestra for some cats or something. That's not me. I was more in contact with these people and that's what I'm so proud of. Klaus, that really is a great story and a great journey. Of course, one of the high points is when you were still, a, as a very, very young guy, meeting the Beatles in Hamburg back then. Uh, how did that come about? Well, it's interesting because on that box set... <laughs> we're going to be finding out more about that. The shortly. first track <laughs> yeah. that's on there is a song where I play bass for the first time in my life. I never had a bass guitar in my hand. When I was 61, I was going into the Top Ten Club, Stuart Sutcliffe, who was the bass player of the Beatles sure. at the time, completely unknown band at the mm -hmm. time, of course. It was early morning hours. He took the bass, stuck it in my hand, and said, come on, Klaus, you play the bass now. I said, oh, I can't do this. But they said, come on, Klaus, you play. And they come up on stage and said, no, I'm not going to come up on stage. So I sat in front of the stage with a bass guitar, and the first song we played was a Fetch Domino number. And how did it go? And that one was, I told Paul about this, because I said, I'm going to do this box set, yeah. and I want you to be part of it, and this would be a great opportunity, mm -hmm. because that's where I really played for the first time, and you played the piano on stage in the top ten. And he said, yes, it was called I'm in Love Again by Fats Domino. That's the first number I played on. So we recorded that. Okay, you mentioned Paul McCartney there. Of course, Paul McCartney and John Lennon now uh, have gone down in musical history as sort of absolutely stellar songwriters. They're somewhere up there with, I don't know, with Mozart or something. Did you realise back then when you, when you met these youngsters that they had the touch of genius about them? It's interesting because they only played uh, uh, copies, made, copied American and most, mostly American uh, rock and roll songs. There was not one song they wrote themselves. 
So could you sense that they were going to go on and write their own material? Was there that energy about them? And was there that sort of, I think John Lennon was a person who was very interested. In, they both wanted to learn and learn and learn. Yeah. Yes, they were eager. Yeah. Very, very eager. And they didn't like it. anybody made a mistake. They hated it. And uh, they were rehearsing a lot. And they had the longest list of songs of any of the bands. Mm-hmm. Ridiculous, all the songs they knew well, they had and to the play, words. They, they played, you know, they played seven-hour sessions in the yes, evenings. So. Yes, and the very, in the very start, they had to play the whole night by themselves in the yeah. club, which <laughs> means they'd play for 45 minutes, and they had a little break, yeah. and up they went again and played all night through. Mm-hmm. Later on, it was two bands. When yeah. I saw them first, there was the Kaiser Keller. Yeah. And that was Rory Storm and the Hurricanes with Ringo with on the Ringo. drums. Yeah. And uh, was uh, the Beatles playing in the club. And they uh, took alternate, you know, one band, the next band. Just tell me, the, on a side man's tr- talking about composers, we talk about Lennon and McCartney. George Harrison was a considerable composer, yeah? You've mentioned your close friendship yeah. to him. There's three of his numbers on your new record. Yeah, just tell me a little bit about George Harrison. What made him so special? Uh, well, in the first place, he was uh, uh, sort of held back when the Beatles were recording because they had so many songs, they didn't know which one to record first. There was just an immense, uh, the amount of stuff they put out was so much. So George always was on the, on the wrong side of the stick. Mm-hmm. He had the drawer full of fantastic songs which he let out when we did All Things Must Pass. Is that something he talked to you about, about how maybe how painful that was, being sort of sidelined a little bit? No, I didn't. I don't know. Mostly it was the case, but he did not tell me that he was frustrated about it. Okay. He told me later, yes, but not at the time. Okay. Um, Well, um, here it is. There it is, down there. uh, The ultimate document of the journey that Klaus has been on. We've mentioned it already. A magnificent box set, CD, DVD, book, and a signed piece of uh, Klaus's artwork. We've also got a signed copy of the CD, A Sideman's Journey, that we've been talking about. And if you want to win one of these prizes, just write to us, including comments on the show, of course, at uh, the following address, DWTV, Talking Germany Team at Walterstrasse number 6, 13355 Berlin, Germany, or send us an email at talkinggermany at dwworld.de and we need to hear from you within 14 days and I should remind you that our decision is final. Now, uh, Klaus, we're going to talk uh, now about a completely different subject. We've been talking about music so far. We're going to talk about dyslexia mm. because you are a sufferer. We're going to talk about it in a little bit more depth. But I would like to ask you about whether the fact that you suffered from dyslexia was one of the reasons why you became a musician. No. Not really. I was doing graphics and I didn't even know that this was the case till very, very late. Oh. Suddenly I realized it myself. I actually saw a program on TV where they said that people were doing tests, like one guy was putting his hand through a, uh, uh, through a hole yeah. and then he had to choose one of the objects that was there. That was a cup and there was a toothbrush and there was a, a book. And then he took the hand out and then the guy said, come on, take your other hand and find the object you just touched. And they put the the hand through that slit and he could not find the object. He didn't know what he just touched. Mm -hmm. But those are people with epileptic fits where they actually separated the brain halves. So that's completely cut off. I mean, I don't think that's the case with me, but I'm sure that there is an underdeveloped part uh, that does not transfer. And then the same guy put the hand in and made with a brush. He heard, heard it phonetically. And then the next time when he went in with the left hand, he found immediately the brush. Because phonetically it went from one brain to the other. So if I see a book or something, I read something, I have to read it loud. If I don't read it loud, it does not stick with me. It's gone, it's gone immediately. Okay. Before we went into that report, you were telling me that you didn't really know until you were maybe in your 20s that you, yeah. you suffered from this complaint. But at school, you had a hard time, certainly from the teachers, but you didn't know why it was coming your way, really. Yes, I had no idea. I thought everybody was like that. You know? <laughs> and I realized much, much later, not even when I was 20, I, mm. I got to know it much later. 
I, I, I had problems, in particular with reading music, like sometimes you get music, I can't read music. I mm -hmm. mean, the music teacher tried so hard, he even put a, a thing around my neck, don't look at your fingers, look at the music. No way. I mean, John Lennon also suffered from dyslexia. Did I you? didn't know. You didn't know that? No. So you didn't see that at the time? No. Yeah. Tell me this, uh, Klaus, is, is dyslexia, is it, I, I said in the introduction to that report that it's still a bit of a taboo in Germany. Is that true or have things moved on? No, people don't believe you when you, when you tell them, like my brother doesn't believe it. <laughs> he he still doesn't believe you. Just he just thinks you, you're, you're rotten at spelling. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. yeah? Have you developed your own strategies for, for dealing with Definitely. the problems I that mean, arise? Definitely. I mean, you build your little bridges to, to cope with it. Uh, moments, <clears throat> the hardest moments are when people uh, give you a piece of paper and read it, and then they talk to me. Uh, that's impossible. I can't take both in. I have to read what okay. I'm supposed to go in loud. And if I don't do that, sometimes I even do this, talk in my ear, you know, like, like <laughs> this, so that I hear it. When I hear it, then it sticks. Okay, that's an interesting aspect of the life of uh, Klaus Forman. Another aspect, yeah, I, I said you look very fit. You certainly do, yeah. Thank uh, you. Is that in part because you're a vegetarian? I would think so, yes. I'm very healthy. I can't complain. And a knock on wood, I can't. <laughs> my head is maybe the best. Uh, uh, I am uh, not a strict vegetarian, mm -hmm. but I uh, don't eat steaks and stuff, you know. And I know that you can't live without, I'm, I'm convinced that everybody could live without eating meat. We're talking about vegetarian food and uh, haute cuisine. Uh, Klaus has told me you were recently on an interesting outing with, with Ringo and Paul. That's right. We went to a restaurant yeah. a couple of years, no, several years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was great because Ringo was one of those who only a steak and chips yeah. or a hamburger. And that was it. And he was, had no culture whatsoever talking about food. And suddenly we went to this restaurant. And he said, oh, you have to we're, we're in London here. In London, yeah. in a beautiful restaurant. Mm -hmm. I have forgotten the name of it. It was just beautiful. Yeah. And uh, the food was incredible. And it was on the table. And he said, oh, t taste a little Ringo. Suddenly, he said, <laughs> you have to taste a little bit of this in combination with this. He was really into food, uh -huh. which you definitely can be without meat. No, no doubt about it. So I, I read somewhere, Klaus, that uh, that you uh, you first began eating vegetarian food when you lived with George Harrison. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. I was in Friar Park, and that's where George's estate where he lived, and I was uh, living there, and I was living with him, so to speak. It was breakfast, lunch, dinner. So I was always all the time with him. And there was Kuma, a friend of George's, an, uh, an Indian guy who cooked beautiful food. Mm -hmm. And uh, Patty cooked beautiful food too. And a month later, I suddenly realized that I hadn't eaten any meat. I didn't miss anything. Oh, yeah. It was just beautiful food. I never had such good food in my life. And so why should I carry so, on eat any meat? So I said, stop it. So you've never looked back. But that's interesting because you mentioned India. I was in India recently and it's, yeah. uh, you know, where an awful lot of people are vegetarians. And yeah. I was talking to an Indian woman who's a vegetarian and she said, uh, she was very worried because she's going to Bavaria shortly, and that's the part of the world that you live in. And Bavaria yeah. is very meat heavy, isn't it? It is, if you go in a typical Bavarian restaurant, but you've got the choice these days. You don't have to go there. Plus, even on those menus today, mm -hmm. you always go to a section for vegetarians, you know, where it says just vegetarian sure. or something. Yeah. And at the same time, you can go to an Italian restaurant. Or it's all there. Munich is really like the center of Europe, and you have Italians, Spanish people, or a mixture of people. They're not just Bavarian. Changing times, even in meat-heavy Bavaria. Um, well, this is perhaps the, the right moment for me to uh, draw your attention once again to my blog where you're going to get some behind-the-scenes impressions of uh, my guests, including Klaus Vormann. Uh, check it all out. It's on our internet site. If you like Talking Germany, you can find out more on the internet. Our host, Peter Craven, is keeping a blog on the many shows and guests of the series. Find out more about what happens behind the scenes, gossip, experiences, and how the whole show is put together. Just visit blogs.dw-world.de slash Talking Germany. And you can tell us what you think about the program there, too. 
Okay, Klaus, time to uh, wrap up the show with our traditional Talking Germany quiz. Quick questions, relatively quick answers, please. Um, are you more a musician or more an artist? An artist musician. <laughs> uh, we've just been talking about it, Klaus. You, you were born in Berlin, so I've got to ask you the question, Berlin or Bavaria? Berlin. Lennon or McCartney? Lennon. Or Harrison. <laughs> Home cooking or haute cuisine? Home cooking. You've played on two of my favourite songs of all time, yeah? And I've got to ask you to choose between the two. You're So Vain by Carly Simon, Without You by Harry Nilsson. Without You. Lovely. One of my favourites. Thank you for being with us today, Klaus Vorman. He's been a great guest. He's a very charming man. Uh, a great musician. He's been on an interesting journey. I hope you've enjoyed his company as much as I have. If you have, come back next week. Just.